Hello everyone, and welcome back to another build tour, this time of my new e-paper-based weather display. Now, e-paper is one of those things that I've always loved ever since I first saw it on the first Kindle. The difference in display, the fact that it reflects light rather than emitting it, and it's very readable in sunlight in any condition, is really interesting to me. And I've always really wanted to do something with it, especially when, in the last couple of years, they've started introducing e-papers that have more than just two colors. Traditionally, you just get black and white. Uh, the way e-paper works is it basically captures very small uh, bits of ink in cells and then like shows or hides them. A little bit like an etch -a sketch if you ever use one of those. But as time's gone on, they've finally worked out a way to get more than one color. And in this case, I have a two color, well, technically three color piece of e-paper. It has red and black and of course white where the ink is not present. And so when I saw this, I was like, well, I want to finally get around to one of the projects I've always wanted to do which is a passive weather display that hangs on my wall. Now, I could just use an old tablet for this and put a web page up and do it that way, but ePaper is perfect for this. It has very minimal power consumption, it's very readable in sunlight and also artificial light. Basically, as long as there's light shining on it, you can read it pretty well. And it's one big trade-off is very slow refresh times, which is not really a big problem for a weather display. And so as a result, when I saw this particular kind of ePaper was available, I ordered one from China and it got here a couple of weeks later. Shipping is always a little bit slow. And then I set to work trying to think about how I would design the actual weather display. And so here today, I'm going to walk you through some of those steps, show you some of the code and the layout I use and how I made the actual device itself, and then finally leave you with some ideas of maybe how to build your own or other things you can do with ePaper as well. But first, let's talk about the actual device. So. What we have here is we have essentially uh, e-paper on the front. It is in an acrylic frame, which is laser cut. And if you look in the center, there is a Raspberry Pi mounted right in here. Now, the e-paper I bought comes with a driver board for the Raspberry Pi, built as a Raspberry Pi hat. What that means is you can just plug it into these standard headers on any Raspberry Pi and just download some software in either C or Python. I would, of course, recommend Python and you can just get going. There's example code and everything. And that's really convenient for a thing like this. I could, of course, get an Arduino and do full-on coding and do it properly and make sure there's low power consumption, run it off batteries, but this is kind of one of those products of opportunity. And so while the Raspberry Pi does mean I've got to plug it into the mains power and have it running at all times, that's fine. I'm okay with a small USB charger dangling off the wall. Honestly, I can live with that. And so essentially, there's not very many pieces to this. When I had the display, like I had the display, it came with a hat, the driver board, and I just happened to have a, as most nerds do, worryingly large number of Raspberry Pis lying around the house. So I grabbed a Raspberry Pi 3, because that has Wi-Fi built in. I stuck the two together and just started running the example code. And my first sort of thrust or part of the project was to actually write the thing that shows on the display. Of course, there's lots of options here, but I wanted something that was flexible in particular, that I didn't have to you know, log into the Raspberry Pi, reflash it, or update the code whenever I change something. And so rather than write a fully fledged uh, piece of software that runs on the Raspberry Pi that like, downloads weather data and renders it to the screen, instead, I wrote a very simple script that downloads an image from a URL and then just renders that to the screen. I then tied that script up into a cron job and said, hey, every 30 minutes, fetch this URL and then just show the results on the screen. I uploaded that to the Raspberry Pi and essentially the software for the actual device was done. Now I love doing things like this, where I can make the actual display device itself pretty dumb, as it were, and write all the logic somewhere else. Not only because in cases of things like Arduinos and things with less processing power than a Raspberry Pi, it lets you offload that to a sort of much more powerful server, but also just because of the ease of use and maintenance. I can sit on my computer and upload and change the software on a cloud server pretty instantaneously without having to run down, like pull an SD card out, or SSH into the machine and like update the repositories. It's just in general a lot easier. And so that's kind of why essentially this isn't really a weather display board, it's a random URL display board that happens to be showing data drawn from a weather server. So with that in mind, the next step before I actually built the device and finished it off was to write the actual thing that renders the weather here. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. I'll link my Git repository for all this code in the description so you can read about it as well. 
But essentially, what this does is it pulls information from, work, from a weather API. In this case, I believe it's Open Weather Map, who have a very reasonable free plan, and you can pay them. And I suggest you do if you're using them, so they keep going. And it downloads that and sort of works out a summary. Now, what I've got here is a mostly final working version. It shows the current day, it shows the current temperature, the minimum and maximum in the next 24 hours, and sort of a short summary of the next couple of hours and then tomorrow's weather, along with sunrise and sunset. And so essentially, I just have a honestly kind of ugly, please don't judge me on this, couple of hundred lines Python script that pulls down that data, parses it from the API, it's JSON, so if you've done some programming, that's pretty standard, and then there's a whole big ugly chunk of Python that uses uh, Pillow, the Python imaging library, to just render all this information into a basically an image canvas. Now, there is one trick, of course. Um, this is a three-card device, I said, and I mean that. It's not grayscale. You can't do like black and then some grays and then some white. It is just full black, full red, or full white. There is no other colors. As a result, you can't do a thing called anti-aliasing, which most screens do, which smooths the edges of fonts using levels of gray. If you've never noticed it, look, look closely now and you'll see it. That's kind of tricky because most modern display libraries, Pillow included, kind of presume that you're writing to a display that was written sometime this millennium and thus it has more than, let's say, 16 colors and can do anti-aliasing. Thankfully, Pillow can be convinced to have a paletted canvas, that is one that has a very limited number of colors. And so that script tells Pillow, hey, make a canvas, it has exactly three colors, and then show graphics on it. And what that lets us do is it lets me, essentially, when I render the fonts, the font library understands, ah, I can't anti-alias here, I've got to have those hard edges, and it tries to do its best. Now, the other part of the whole anti-aliasing being popular thing is that most modern fonts are, of course, built for anti-aliasing. And so as a result, if you look closely on the display, there are pieces of the letters that really are not happy because they want to be about one and a half pixels wide. And of course, you just can't render that on a display like this. You get one or two pixels as a hard edge. And so some of the thinner strokes look particularly bad. This can be solved by using fonts that are designed for um, displays like this that cannot do anti-aliasing, and I will go and hunt those down in time. But again, laziness is one of the key drivers of my builds, and so I didn't do that for the first version. And honestly, if you stand more than about a meter away, it looks fine anyway. It just is not super great on close inspection. So that's kind of all there is to the rendering server. It is a small Python Flask web app. There is a single URL. You hit it, and it renders you an image. And that is then, of course, called by the device. Um, the device has a cron tab set up, which is, of course, the way to run things periodically on Unix systems. And that cron tab literally just says, hey, every 30 minutes, call this URL and then run this Python script to show the result. And that's kind of all there was to the software. For you know, some of the projects I do, there's a lot of software involved, like the 3D printing ones and the map layout ones. This was maybe done in a couple of hours, and that was mostly because I felt bad about just how ugly it was the first time. It's now slightly less ugly, though still not super readable. The next and final step was to take the actual device itself and make it mountable. Now, there's a couple of options for this, of course. 3D printing is always one, but I do have a laser cutter, and laser cut acrylic is very nice. And so I chose to use laser cut acrylic for the frame here. Now, if you look, there are basically two pieces of acrylic. There's one on the front and there's one on the back. And between them, I've used a set of standoffs to just basically keep them together. I could have cut a full acrylic frame with like actual four edges as well and made them sort of interlock and have like a nice edging and like feathering or whatever. I'm not too bothered about that. Like this kind of looks fine. It's a little bit industrial looking, but that's kind of the thing I'm going for anyway. And so, Basically, I laser cut my pieces, and then I went about assembly. That whole process took about, I'm gonna say, 10 minutes to put together. I have a time lapse of me doing it, and as you can see, it's not exactly a very complex process. One thing I'm not quite sure if I'm proud of yet or not is that I actually sellotape the e-paper onto the front screen. 
I was trying to think of a mounting solution. The one problem with this piece of e-paper is it doesn't really have a way of mounting it. There's no screw holes built into it, apart from two very tiny screw holes right at the bottom of the frame. That wouldn't provide enough holding for my liking. It's kind of, there'd be a lot of leverage. It could be pushed in. And, you know, at some point it is kind of thin and light, a bit like paper, and the salad tape's honestly holding really well. And so without any other things that come up, I'm gonna keep it like that and make it work. And so once it was all together, um, that was kind of it. Uh, this is honestly one of the simpler builds I've done. Uh, the only remaining thing is to go and put two screws into a wall somewhere and hang it up. And of course, trailer uh, power adapter down so it can be charged up at the same time. Now, in terms of things I want to do for this one, it's a bit difficult. Um, I would love to have it updating more regularly than every half an hour, but as I'm gonna show you, the refresh rate on ePaper is slow. Now, I'm sure you're used to slow in terms of like you've seen a Kindle refresh maybe, like it's like a second or two to like load the page and the whole screen inverts from black to white and black again. That's pretty standard for like ePaper or e-ink. This is a lot, lot longer. I think part of the way they got the third color working is having this much more extended refresh period. And so as you run it, and as you can see, it just takes maybe 10, 15 seconds. It depends like how much clearing it has to do. That is honestly the main thing against using this for anything that updates more regularly. Like you couldn't do a clock on this, for example. Like maybe every minute, but you'd spend, you know, 20% of that minute refreshing and updating. As a result, like I kind of wanted to also look at like, can I have my house status or things like which doors or windows are open because I've got sensors on them here on a display, but that's not really gonna work for something like this because like if you close a door and it takes, you know, a, on a five minute interval to update, it's not quite what I'm going for in terms of usage. So I think a weather display is kind of the right call, at least for now. There are some other things I can think of, things of like, where have I been in the world recently? Of course, not a huge concern for me right now, but hopefully when traveling starts again, that's more of a thing. And maybe other things too, like temperature graphs over time or I don't know, to-do lists. There, there is a very large number of things you could use ePaper for. And the beauty of the code here is that the entire piece of code on the device is reusable. I just have to log in and change the URL at points to, and it'll start rendering something else every 30 minutes or every 15 minutes, whatever you change the schedule to. The other one thing I kind of want to add is a small button that force refreshes. That shouldn't be too hard to do. Raspberry Pis do have GPIO, that's general purpose input output, and you can read it from Python. So you could put a button across two of the pins and when the button is depressed and circuit is closed, you could trigger that same script to call the URL again. So I might do that just as a kind of fun, like hit the button to refresh thing. But again, it's weather, like weather is not a thing that's really changing. Well, it does a little bit minute to minute uh, here in Colorado, but in general, weather is weather. It's kind of long-term, it's perfectly fine. So that's kind of the device. Um, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, I've linked a list of components and a blog post and sort of more information and like the code below in the description if you wanna go read more about that and maybe use some of it to build your own. Um, I will warn you, a lot of the code is not super reusable. Uh, it is written very much for my purposes. Um, it is maybe some of the worst Python code I've written in many, many years because I have this scale of, other people will see it and use it, and like my team at work will use it, that code I try and make pretty nice, to quick Andrew project hack, that code tends to be pretty bad, and this is certainly the latter. So the code is up there. If you want to reuse it or build on it, you can. Expect to do some fiddling around. Uh, if you do like Fahrenheit, first of all, I'm sorry. Second of all, changing the units from this from Celsius to Fahrenheit wouldn't be too hard as well. And the e-paper is pretty easy to use, honestly. It comes in a lot of sizes, at least from the provider I use, which is Waveshare. Um, this, I think, is the 5.83 inch one, which you actually measure it is 14 by nine centimeters. That's the real measurement in my personal eyes. Um, but they have ones all the way up to about 12 inches, and those are very expensive, down to tiny, small, cheap ones that are like, you know, a couple of inches across. Um, those are a good range of sizes. I think the color options are either red and black or red and yellow if you want the two color ones or if you want one of the single color ones, um, those are a bit cheaper and they do refresh faster. They also do offer 16 color grayscale ones and those ones a bit like Kindles will do anti-aliasing on fonts and so things will look a lot nicer. So I might get one of those in and just see how it works. But I do love having that red color on this. Like there's something about 
color in ePaper that just makes it pop. And that's what I love it. So I'll leave you with that. I'll leave you with a few more shots of this. Um, I'm really happy with how this build turned out. It was a nice quick one. It's almost a one day build, but in reality it was two or three days because weekends are never long enough. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna probably make a few changes, add a few more weather icons, try and tidy up the fonts, but honestly, it's pretty good to go and I'll be on my wall probably right after this video goes up. So leave you with a few shots of that and until next time, I'll see you then.